Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. That's right before 2 Samuel. <laughs> that gets you in the ballpark. First Samuel chapter 17. It's a perhaps most familiar story on the face of the earth is David and Goliath. I don't know of any person that probably hadn't heard that phrase, David versus Goliath. We heard it in our vacation Bible school and in our Sunday school classes. We've seen movies about it. Uh, if you watch a lot of sports, you'll see that. The underdog uh, will be uh, called the David versus the highly favored uh, team that they're playing. And it's a David and Goliath story. And so that analogy is used all over the world. And so it's a very familiar story. So uh, even for the people that are lost, people that uh, don't even come to church or know God uh, through Jesus Christ, they know the story of David and Goliath. And so uh, there's uh, nothing new that I can uh, preach to you about it, but I love this story. And uh, I tell you, there's many of us today uh, are facing giants in our lives. Um, if you're not facing a giant, don't worry. If it's gonna, you're going to face giants. Uh, you're going to have something in your life come up uh, that's going to be too big uh, for you. That's going to be something that uh, you're going to have to deal with. And uh, this is what happened to David. So I'm going to read uh, several verses to give you the background of what we're talking about and get us back into it. Then I'm going to preach a little bit to you. And then I'm going to let you go a little later. All right. Chapter 17, verse 1. The Bible tells us, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Sukkot which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Sukkoth and Azekai, and Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Eli, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are you come out? to set the battle in array. Am not I a Philistine and your servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be, uh, we will be your servants. But I, if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help us, Lord. Father, I, I pray you'd preach to me this morning, Lord. I realize there's some folks in a valley this morning, Lord. I realize there's folks facing giants, Lord, in their life. And God, I just pray, Lord, you touch some heart this morning, Lord. Father, you lift some burden, Lord. You work in our lives, Lord, it started right here behind this pulpit, Lord God, and working out through these uh, pews and down the aisles, Lord Father. Uh, we need you to do something supernatural, Lord, and get a victory this morning, Lord, that uh, only you can get. And so, God, I just pray you'd help me to say what only you'd have me to say. And Lord Father, just empty me, uh, myself, Lord, and, and all my sinfulness and my wretchedness, Lord Father, and fill me with your sweet spirit this morning, Lord, that I might preach. And I thank you praise you. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, this is a very well-known story. The Bible goes into great detail, but perhaps like no other story, detailing what's going on. The, the, uh, the characters or the people that are involved in it, are, it's gone into great detail. So, uh, very detailed 58 verses, I believe, in this one chapter that goes in just to this battle. So, uh, we can know in great detail what's going on. And so, uh, the Bible is very specific about the location of this battle. It's, it's very specific about the situation in this battle. But first look at the location of this battle. It says in that first one, it gives us the place 
uh, that it happened. Uh, it gives us uh, the valley that it happened. And so you get the picture here. Uh, there's a valley down below. The armies of God on one side. The Philistines over on this side. And here's Goliath coming down into the valley. And listen, nobody wants to go and fight in the valley, do they? I don't like the valley. I don't want to go down in the valleys. I like it up on the mountain. Top. I like it where it's safe. I like it where the sun is shining and everything is rosy. And I, I prefer to stay up there. But eventually, uh, you're going to have to come down into the valley. Now, if you've got any age on you at all, you realize that you've already been in the valley. And you may be in a valley this morning. But I want to tell you, there's a giant down there that wishes to crush you, to destroy you. And that, he wants to strike fear into you. And every person in the army, even King Saul, was fearful to go down in this valley for God and fight in the valley. Listen, if we're going to be the Christians that uh, God's called us to be, we're going to have to be willing to go down in the valley. Amen. We're going to have to be willing to fight down in the valley. Now the location of this thing is important. I want you to notice this one phrase in here in <coughs> verse 1 says that the Bible uh, tells us here that they were gathered in Sukkot, that the belongings of Judah, and they pitched between these two places, Sukkot and then Asak, and it was in Ephesus, Damon. Ephes Damon. Now the word Ephes Damon uh, really is, is, is one of the most important words here in the whole story. Uh, in order to get a hold of this spiritually speaking, uh, not only practically but spiritually speaking, the word means uh, the boundary of blood. Isn't that good? I don't think I'll preach on that. The boundary of blood. In other words, the Philistines were gathered over here. Israel's gathered over here. And uh, right in between them was this Ephesus demon. And the word means it's a boundary of the blood. And so uh, you know what a boundary is. If we were to uh, kind of summarize that, a boundary is a barrier. <laughs> and it keeps you from going into another area. It could be an object there or a fence or whatever it is. Uh, but there's boundaries in life. Everybody sees them. If you go now to a restaurant, they got the boundaries set up. Those little pool things there, and you walk along the line, and you don't go over here. If you go to a crime scene, it says crime investigation. You don't go over that boundary. There's fences up at our houses and stuff, and so there's boundaries everywhere. But there's one boundary. Uh, listen, there's one boundary that's important here, and that's the boundary of the blood. You see, the boundary of the blood is, is not only a place physically, practically, but it's a place spiritually. Listen, a boundary, you're either on one side of the boundary or you're on the other side. Is that right? You're either going to be on one side of it or the other. In other words, they were on one side of the blood and the enemy was on the other side of the blood. Listen, I could have told them they was making a big mistake right there. Before they ever gathered and started to fight against God's people, uh, they made the biggest mistake in their life. They got on the wrong side of the boundary of blood. Listen, you're either on one side of the blood this morning or you're on the other side of the blood. Amen. That's all through the Bible. You can go back all the way to Exodus. Uh, when the children came out of Egypt there, God said, listen, I'm going to send the angel of death through here tonight. And I'm going to set a boundary up. And you better make sure that when he comes through at midnight that you're on the right side of that boundary. Yeah. He said, here's what the boundary is. I want you to... Mm. Y'all not with me. Somebody be hollering by now if you're with me. I want you to take some blood and I want you to put it over the doorpost. But let me tell you, you get inside that blood, you get on the other side of the door. You get on the other side of the door and don't you dare come out because the only way you're going to make it if you're on the other side of that boundary, you're on the other side of the blood. Amen. And everybody that was on the other side of the blood that night was okay, but everybody that was on the outside the door on the other side of that boundary. They died that night. Listen, you better know what side of the blood you're on this morning. Yes, if you're going to go down into valleys and you're going to have to walk through those valleys alone and the shadow of the valley of death, the, the valleys are full in the Bible and the valleys are going to be in our lives, you better make sure that you're on the right side of the boundary of blood before you go down there and try to face your giants. <coughs> Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood. Colossians 1, 20. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood that makes the boundary this morning. You're on one side of it or you're on the other side of it. 
You're either ready to go out and face your giants in the valley, or you're like the rest of Israel that day. They were just scared. They were just fearful of the giant in the valley. Not only does this uh, location mean something here, this boundary of blood uh, that we see here very first off in the first three verses, but we're also, uh, great detail was gone into the situation concerning the battle. There's all kinds of notes about the champion of the enemy and the champion of God's people. You know, there's two champions, right, that are going at it in the Bible. They start there in Genesis, and it travels through, all the way through the Bible, and then one of them finally gets the victory over it. Now notice what's going on here with Goliath. The Bible says it was nine feet tall and nine inches. That's, that's what, uh, if you see the cubit, the span there, that's what he was. Nine foot tall, nine inches. He was a champion of the enemies of God. His armor uh, weighed 125 pounds. He carried around 125 pounds on The head of the spear weighed 25 pounds just by itself. And you'll notice all through the verses there, verses 4, 5, 7, if you read, start reading that, notice the number 6. Everything described about him, you see the number six involved. And that's very uh, telling. If you're a student of the Bible, you realize that six is the number of man. Okay? Let me, let me tell you where I get that. First of all, man was created on what? That's in Genesis. Let's take it all the way through the Bible. You'll find six always representing man, always representing the world over and over again. But you get to the book of Revelations and you realize that six really means something because in the book of Revelation it says that they'll some receive the mark. Here is the wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for the number of the man. And his number is six hundred and three score and six. Now, what does that mean? That's the number six. Six, six. And all through here, I believe Goliath is a type of that one uh, that is against us. He's, a type, he's the devil. He's the, uh, the antichrist. He is against us. He is our enemy. And you'll notice uh, the people of God, it says, were dismayed. They literally means the word dismayed there in verse 11 means that uh, they were broke down by this giant. That's what that word means. As so many of us today, our homes are broken because Satan's in there. He's the giant in the room and he's taken us at his will and, and our homes are no longer godly and we're broke down and broken. And, we, and listen, uh, we wonder what's going on. Well, it's the devil. He is your enemy. And notice what he was doing here. He was taunting them. He was mocking them. He was uh, accusing them. And he done it all. Verse 16 says he done all that for 40 days. Now notice that 40 days, that's significant. You'll see that in the Bible. It's always a period of testing, a period of tempting, a period of judgment. Our Lord and Savior, if you recall, went up against this same giant, the devil, in the, in the Gospels. And he went out to the wilderness after his baptism. And he went 40 days and 40 nights without eating or drinking. And he was tempted. And he came out at the end, though, he came out victorious because he said, listen, the Lord, listen, He said, it is written. He's the Word of God. You want to be able to fight your giants in the, the battles? You want to be able to win in life? You must, be, you must be in the Word of God. You must be competent in the Word of God. So many of us are weak and apathetic because we're weak in the Scriptures. We don't know the Scriptures. We haven't wrote them on our heart. They're not our meat day and night. And we wonder why we can't. Get over on our giants. Because we ain't got God's Word with us. And so there's a lot of description over and over again about Goliath. And I believe he represents the enemy that's against you and I today. And that's Satan. Now, he's also very specific in this situation about the people's Savior. Okay? The people's Savior. And throughout chapter 17, we get a look at this man, David. First of all, verse 15 says he was a shepherd. Does that remind you of anything? Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Uh, and David was that one that gave his life for the sheep. Uh, he was from Bethlehem. Does that sound familiar to you? He was from Bethlehem. If we read on down there, uh, it says in verse 28 that David went unto his brethren, and his brethren received him not. Uh, and so those pictures of Christ are all through David's life. He is so much. He is uh, so much like Christ that Christ would come out of his lineage, and that's King David. And so, all these verses I believe point to David as being a type 
of our greater David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if you read the story here, uh, David represents the people by himself. And that's important. None of the rest of them could go out and defeat that giant. Did you notice that? None of them could go out there and, and go out there and battle him one on one and get the victory. But he represented the people. He was their champion. He was their representative. He was their propitiation. He did what they couldn't do. And there's one this morning that can do what you can't do. And that saved you to get you on the other side of the boundary of blood to win the victory for you. His name is Jesus Christ. And so David represents the Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting that after, in verse chapter 18, verse 1, it says that after Jonathan saw David do what he did, the Bible says he saw David and he loved him. Listen, when you finally see Jesus, you can't help but love him. And it says that he made a covenant with David. In other words, he got in a blood covenant. You know, a covenant in the Old Testament, when they say that, it means to cut. It means to, to bleed. That's what the word covenant means. And it's not like you and I think of a covenant today. We think of a contract we sign. But in the Old Testament, when it says that Jonathan made a covenant with David, it says after he saw David go out there and whoop the giant for him, he saw him as he was, see, who he really was. And he said, I love him. He said, my soul is knit. In other words, it's taken and sewed right into David's soul. In other words, whatever David was, Jonathan was. Whatever Jonathan was, David was. And they came into a covenant together. The word covenant means cut. In other words, he said, listen, here's how we're gonna, here's how we're gonna take this covenant and make it real in our lives. And you know what they did? They cut their seal. Old David cut his seal. Jonathan cut his seal. And they made a covenant that day. And see, they had the blood between them. That's the Old Testament covenant. And I saw Jesus one day in my life. Not for what I thought he used to be, but I finally saw him for who he really was. He was my Savior. Yeah. And when I saw Jesus as my victor, as my champion, you know what? I just, I just fell in love with him. And my soul was knit with his. And his was knit with mine. And we got under a covenant together. And now we've got the blood between us. Amen. And so David all over, it just reeks of Jesus Christ from one to the other. He's the, he was fair. The Bible says there in verse 42, if you just read chapter 17, it says when the giant saw him, he was ruddy, he was young, and it was fair of countenance. In other words, that was one good looking young man. He was fair to look upon. Jesus said he's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. And so it's easy, even, even in just a glance at this chapter, you can figure out so many things about Christ and so many things about his victory over Satan on the cross of Calvary. Now I want to also show you and close with a few things to help you. The Bible, I believe, not only gives us the location, the situation, some spiritual insight there about who David was. Uh, and, and who Goliath was, and who they represented. Uh, this is an actual story. It's a shadow. It's a type. But there's also practical applications from this battle that you can take and use in your life to get the battle, to get the victory over the giants in your life. First of all, I want you to notice that David was faithful in the small stuff. David was faithful. Write this down. David was faithful in the small stuff. Verse, uh, over in chapter uh, 16 to chapter 4, 17, we won't read that, but in verse 13, Saul, Samuel came and already had anointed David king. You remember that situation where all the sons, uh, Samuel didn't know exactly which son of Jesse it was, and so he said, bring them all out. And he brought one out, the oldest. He said, nah, God said that ain't it. They brought another one out. Nah, he ain't it. Brought all the sons out. Samuel said, I know God told me to come here and anoint one of your uh, sons, Jesse. None of these are it. You must have another son. He said, yeah, I got one out there looking after the sheep. He said, bring him in. He was looking at... Y'all didn't get that. Y'all didn't say amen. He was looking after the sheep and he come in. Jesse said, that's the, and Samuel said, that's the one, Jesse. Amen. And he got up and anointed him. Yeah. This man was already king 
He was already king. Listen to me. When this battle was raging and the Philistines were over here and God's people were hunkered down and fearful over here and the boundary of blood was there between them and they were all fearful for their lives and scared to go out there and face the giant that was in before them in the valley. And David was already king, but the Bible says that when he came from his father, you know what he was doing? He was just looking after the sheep. Yeah. Now let me read this to you. It says here about David in verse 15, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And so the men, the real men, you know, like me and you, they were tough men. They were all gathered out there to battle. They were important. They were somebody. But little David there, he was just a teenager. He was just kind of a good-looking, young, ruddy-looking little kid. And the king and Jesse said, Listen, while we're doing men's work, why don't you go back over there and look at these few sheep we got out there in the field? And we'll take care of this stuff. You know what David did? He said, I'm all, he said, I'm king. No, he didn't say that. He said, okay. He said, I'll just go back there and look after those sheep because somebody needs to care for the sheep. That's important too. And so David said, I'm going to go back there and look after the sheep. And then Jesse said unto him in verse 17, Take now thy brethren and effort of this parched corn and these ten loaves. In other words, he said he was sent by his father to take bread to his brethren. Yeah. Y'all yeah. get you. Man, come on, wake up this morning. He's the bread of life. And his father sent him down here that we might partake of him and be one with him through faith in him. That's the Lord's son. And that's what David did. His father Jesse said, go out and take some bread to your brethren. The Bible says he left those sheep with a Another shepherd. And he got in his carriage and he went out. And he went to the back. You know, the servant. You know why David, after all his mistakes, and he made a lot of them, Bathsheba and counting the people, the sword never left David's house toward the end of his life. He made some great mistakes. But the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Right. And you know why? Because he had a servant's heart. He was faithful in the small stuff. He was looking after sheep while they were trying to go out there and fight the battles. Mark 9 and 35 says, And he sat down and called the twelve. This is Jesus. And said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Listen, friend, you might scrub the floors down here, but you're going to get a crown up there. Amen. Because God honors the servant above everything else. He doesn't honor it. Listen, his, uh, his thoughts about what we're doing are totally different than the world's thoughts. Yeah. He looks at the one scrubbing the toilet. He looks at the one down there serving somebody. He looks at the one that's out there feeding the hunger. He looks at the one that's humbling themselves and going out to the homeless. He's looking at all that kind of stuff. He's not looking at our uh, bank account, our cars. He ain't looking at any of that thing. He's looking at the servant. He's looking for service. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what he's going to say. They're going to say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do a lot of miracles in your name? But that's not going to get you well done, good and faithful servant. He said, I never knew you. You know, don't expect the bigger things in your life when you can't do the small things. I mean, just don't expect the bigger things from God when you're not doing the small things. Listen, perhaps the Lord has not revealed His will to you because He knows you're not willing to do His will. Like Bob Jones used to say, listen, if you'll, God knows you'll do His will, He'll reveal His will to you. And that's so true. Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say, we can't even do the ABCs and we're looking for bigger things. And we can't even do the little stuff. You know what the little stuff is? Tied. It's kindergarten stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? Coming to church, being faithful to the house of God. That's the ABCs. That's what we're teaching back there in children's church in the nursery. And we can't even do that. And we want God to face our big giants. Hey, we want God to go down into the valley with us. <laughs> reading our Bibles, praying, all that stuff. That's just the ABCs. That's the kid stuff. Right. We can't even do the kid stuff. Amen. And you want God's blessing. 
Amen. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Yes, sir. See, David's victory in the small stuff got him the victory over a big bad giant. Are you faithful in the small things? Not only was David faithful in the small stuff, but David was willing to go it alone. That's one place where the majority is often wrong, isn't it? It's about the things of God. Remember when the, the 12 spies went into the promised land? And the majority, 10 of them said, we just like grasshoppers. They're giants. But his two men said, let's go in there and take them down. Let's go in there and get what God's given us. They said, no, we're going to go with the majority. All the thousands here said, nobody can go out against a lie. David said that he could. Uh, verse 28, he faced criticism from his family. His brother, when he came to bring the bread to his brother, his brother said, I know you're not in this. I know you're just prideful. You just want to, you just want to come out here and see the battle. David said, listen, I don't want to come see the battle. He said, Is there, ain't, ain't there a cause? Is there not a cause? David had a cause. He faced criticism from his family. He was discouraged by others in verse 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. And he is a man of war from his youth. They criticized him. And then when he got through that, and he was doing something for the Lord, they discouraged him. <laughs> I know nobody's ever discouraged you Amen. for something you're doing for the Lord. I know nobody's ever criticized you for the Lord, so let me just speak on my experience. Let, let, I ain't going to get into it. Listen, people will <laughs> criticize you. People will discourage you when you do something for the Lord. Amen. Always will. Always will. David said, I'm willing to go it alone as long as I've got God with me. And then notice in verse 38 and 39, when he faced criticism, he faced discouragement, but then he was also given that worldly advice. Verse 38 and 39 tells of how Saul armed David with his armor and put his helmet of brass on him. And he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded all that stuff on him. And when he got it all on, he hadn't proved it. You know what he said? He said, I can't go out with this. It don't fit. And, and the world, you know what the little world loves to do? That world loves to take. A natural, they like to go against the supernatural with the natural. The world likes to give you the worldly advice so you can go out there and use it against a supernatural enemy and it don't work. Because worldly things don't work against something supernatural. He said, here, this is, this is what you need to do. Put on all that you need to do it this way, David. Well, I'm not going to go out there. But let me just tell you how to do it. <laughs> you know, when you're working and somebody says, look, I ain't trying to tell you how to do that. But if that was me, you ever heard that? Yeah. Sure you have. That's what people do all the time. You try to do something for God. They'll criticize. They'll discourage you. And when you go ahead and do it, something that they wouldn't do in the first place, they got all the advice to give you on how to do it. Well, if you had that much advice, why don't you go out there? Isn't that how it works? Yes. Yeah. Sure, that's how it works. And that's how it works here with David. You see, they're thinking of natural terms, and God's always thinking in supernatural terms. Ephesians 6 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Dude, so I can't take these. I'm not going to operate. Under the world's advice, I'm going to operate under God's leadership and His guidance. I like what it says in verse 40. He took off all that armor and he put it down. And the Bible said he grabbed his staff. Boy, that's good. Isn't it? That must have been what he was thinking about when he wrote Psalms 23. He said, What? Thy rod and thy staff were with me. He said, I'm not going out there with all that worldly mess. I'm just going to go with what God has given me. And I'm going to go along. You know what else David had? David had a record of faithfulness. The faithfulness of God in past victories. You know, through my life, I can look back now 
And I know that God has gotten me the victory over and over again. And I got those things stored up in my mind. And I know if God did it back there, He'll do it up here. Right. Listen, David said when they said he couldn't go out, he said, listen, I looked after the sheep for my father, and a lion came, and a bear came, and God was with me then. And I took a hold of them old animals, and I slew them, and took the lamb right out of his mouth. And I know God will be with me against this army, and against this man, Goliath, who defies the living God. Psalm 63, and you can see this in, in the Psalms that, that David wrote uh, through his life. Psalm 63, <clears throat> verses 6 through 9, he says, When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate upon thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. David was down. He said, You know what? I got the crying. I got the belly aching. I know y'all don't do that, but occasionally I do. Belly aching. David said, I caught myself all of a sudden and I remembered. <laughs> I remember who my God is. Amen. I remember what He's done for me, what He's gave for me. I got a record. His faithfulness. Lastly, David had no interest in taking credit for what only God could do. You notice when he was talking about it? He said, This day in verse 46 and 47, he said, This day will the Lord deliver thee out of my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. You know what he was willing to do? He was willing to bear the reproach of Christ. Think about that. When he went out there, the enemy was hurling insults at David. He was questioning David's honor, David's strength, David's integrity. And David said, you know what? I don't care about what you say about me. I'm not offended that you're hurling insults at the people of God. I'm not offended that you're talking about me and running me down and trying to discourage me. What I'm offended is is that you come up against my God. And you've reproached my God. And you've hurt my God. You see, so many times we stand and we get all tore up about things and we, we just hide behind and so, say, you know, it, how dare you say that about me or something like that. But David said, That's, it's not about me. It's about what you're doing to my God. And he was willing to bear the reproach of God instead of making it all about himself. He put it all on God's shoulders. I wonder this morning, many giants out there in your life, maybe some giants that you need to take care of, maybe some giants that you just can't get over. Maybe some valleys that are facing you and they're right in front of you. You're not willing to go down there and get the victory. It might be because you haven't been faithful in the small stuff. It might be that you're not willing to go it alone. It might be that you start to have a little pity party and you haven't recounted how the goodness of God has brought you this forth. It might be just it's just too much trouble to bear the reproach of the living God. Why should I worry about that? Why should I worry about what's going on out in the world? Well, because it's an insult to your God. That's why you should worry about it. Maybe that's why you're not coming over the giants. Because there's one here this morning that's made a boundary for you. Amen. It's the boundary of blood. Yeah. Listen, when you come on the other side of that, Friend, you're getting the victory. Amen. You're either on one side of the blood this morning or the other. You're either the enemy or you're the people of God. You're either defeated or you're a champion. There's only one, two. One, two places. I wonder if we can just stand. We'll get, what's the number of what we're saying? 636. We'll give you a chance. Maybe you've got a valley. You're walking through, maybe you've got a giant you'd like to get over on this morning. I want to tell you, you can do it by the blood of Jesus, by the cross, by His great power. Maybe you just need that this morning. You come. You come.
Whatever the need is, whatever the giant is, why don't you come and face him this morning? Let's take that giant and deal with him this morning. Just deal with that giant this morning. Whatever valley it is you're walking through, why don't you come and get the victory? Get on the right side of that boundary of blood. Maybe you don't know Jesus this morning. Maybe you never experienced that victory, that freedom of being washed in the blood. Maybe you need that this morning. Why don't you come tell Jesus what's going on in your life? He already knows. You get the victory this morning. If you're not facing a giant, trust me, you will. Don't wait till you get in the valley. Go ahead and get that seven day. You didn't want it all. Come. Tell Jesus. Whatever troubles there are, you come. Whatever giants you're facing. Listen, tell God, listen, I'm going to be faithful in the small stuff. But you might give me the victory in the big stuff. He'll do that for you. He'll take you through the valleys and he'll whoop the giants. He just ran all over that giant. Being dead with at the altar, you come. You come. Don't leave here defeated. You leave here victorious this morning. You leave here a champion this morning.